shall we uh, start? So um, in the last two lectures, we looked at um, definitions and proofs by induction and co-induction. And we did everything very uh, concretely. We did streams, we did automata, we did finite words. Um, and what I want to do in this lecture is basically to do everything again, but now from a categorical perspective. And the idea is to show you how uh, abstracting away from the concrete definitions can then help you devise new induction and co-induction principles for other data types. Okay? So um, I'm going to recall um, the end of the last lecture because we kind of stopped at a, a strange place with the definition of algebra. And then uh, we'll take it from there. So um, if you remember, last time we um, ended by defining functors in set. So if f is a functor in set, then uh, we defined uh, an algebra for f. is um, a set x together with a um, function that goes from fx to x. OK? And a co-algebra for um, f is the same thing, but with the arrow reversed. And so you can think of f in the algebra case as describing the signature uh, of your terms. And alpha gives you a way of building new terms from smaller terms. This is kind of the intuition behind f. In the case of the co-algebra, you have uh, some states in x. And then the alpha tells you how to destruct. So what are the destructors of your data type? So if you remember, in the case of um, streams, you have head and tail. So the one example of an algebra, so let's take a functor, uh, which I'm going to call n. One example of an n algebra are the natural numbers Oops. So you can define alpha sending the um, element of the set 1 to 0 and then if I have something on this side, then I just send it to n plus 1. So the natural numbers are an algebra for um, the functor n. If I take um, a functor s, that takes the Cartesian product of, of some fixed set A with x, then um, the set of infinite streams we looked at last time, together with head and tail, give you an example of an algebra for this functor. So that is an algebra for the functor S. Sorry, that is a co-algebra for the functor S.
can, um, can someone give me an example of a co-algebra for this functor on this side, for the functor nx? Oh, that's okay. That's a good one because it's a co-algebra for the identity monad. So the identity uh, functor that sends a set to itself, uh, that's a functor. And yes, the identity on N is, um, is a co-algebra. It's also an algebra. Um, and you can also take, sorry, I think I misunderstood your example and now I think I'm picking it up. You meant just doing the embedding there with the injection. Um, if you embed uh, the natural numbers in the second component of this co-product, um, then you also have a co-algebra. But there's also another one. Namely, uh, if I take predecessor, so the function that sends n to n minus 1, um, but when I see 0, I will just send it to star. Okay. And it so happens that this example with um, predecessor um, is uh, very much connected with this example of an algebra because it will give you an inverse function. And in fact, the natural numbers have a very special property um, for this algebra. And that's uh, where the induction principle on the natural numbers comes from. And that's what I'll um, do next. So these are examples of algebras and co-algebras. So now we're going to look at some uh, special type of algebras and co-algebras. Let's start with the algebraic one. Um, so we're going to say that if I give you an algebra x alpha for some functor f, we're going to call this algebra initial. If for any other algebra, there exists a unique map into X. No, this is wrong. Uh, sorry. I'm doing the co-algebra version. Uh, an algebra is initial if it has a unique map into any other algebra. And this unique map makes this diagram commute, meaning that beta composed with f of h equals h composed with alpha. So let's see uh, an example of this, OK? And then you will see that actually the uniqueness, sorry, the existence of this map is what gives you um, an induction principle for defining a function. And the uniqueness will give you the proof principle that you can, um, that you can use to 
to prove properties um, like we did last time in the concrete case of uh, finite words. Okay, so let's, um, let's instantiate this for the natural numbers and see what we get. So the functor is fixed, so I'm, do, I'm defining this for a functor f. I don't know who asked the question. I'm, oh, sorry. Um, so, so the functor is fixed. So this is an algebra for a functor f. And then I say, the, for any other algebra for that same functor, there is a unique map h between x and y, between the carrier sets, such that this diagram commutes which is just such that this equation holds. So f is, is a parameter of the definition. Okay? So if we take f to be um, the n functor that we have up there, um, let's try to show that that algebra that we wrote up there for the natural numbers is actually initial for that functor, okay? So what do we need to show? We need to show that if I take um, so if I take the functor n And if I take any other algebra on this side for the same functor, then there exists a unique H that makes this um, diagram commute. So here on top I have the identity on 1 plus H. And here I have... Uh, I didn't give a name to the function. I have the alpha that I wrote up there. So how can we define um, this H and then prove um, uniqueness? So if you read the um, commutativity of this diagram, what you get, you basically get that H composed with alpha is beta composed with this function here, but we know what alpha does. So alpha sends the star to zero and a natural number to its successor, right? So what these equations are telling me is basically that h of 0 is equal to beta of star and that h of n plus 1 is equal to beta of h of n. Okay. Can everyone see that? So if you look at it, you see that this is exactly the pattern in which you define functions by induction. Right? So you, you define the value of the function in n plus 1 by using, in your definition, the value that the function has for value n. So let's look at concrete instance of uh, beta. So take, for instance, uh, the following beta. Let's take y to be the natural numbers as well. And let's take beta to send star to 1 and n to um, 
2 times n. What function h am I defining there? So I'm defining um, a function that basically tells me that h is 1. I'm reading out now these things here for the beta I have. And h of n plus 1 equals 2 times h of n. Right? So which function is this? 2 to the n. So h of n is the function 2 to the n. Okay. So here's an exercise. Take um, the following algebra. Functions from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. And now we're going to define our beta in the following way. Beta of star of n is n. And beta of a function phi applied to n is n plus 1. Okay? And so the question is, what function h am I defining if I take this as the carrier and um, this, the structure? Yeah. Uh, because I made a mistake. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, otherwise it was a bit of a boring one. Okay. So this is an exercise. for algebras. <clears throat> okay. So now we're going to change this definition to work for co-algebras. Uh, maybe this pen is not the best. So a co-algebra is final if, and now what we're going to do, we're going to reverse all the arrows in this diagram. So a co-algebra is final if what do we have? We have x, we have y, we have a unique morphism, but now So now a co-algebra is final if for every other co-algebra there exists a unique map into it. And again, this um, commutativity, you read like that. Alpha composed with H is FH composed with beta. So this is the duality at play. Um, for those of you who have seen a bit of category theory, um, 
this an, an algebra is initial because it is an initial object in a certain category, namely the category of F algebras and F homomorphisms. And a coalgebra is a terminal object in the category of um, F coalgebras and um, F homomorphisms. And if you look, so algebras are just coalgebras in the opposite category. And it is by instantiating the notion of initial algebra in the opposite category that you get the definition of final coalgebra. And that's why you see these arrows all being flipped around. Um, but this is not important for uh, the purpose of this lecture, because I'm going to go through all the concrete instantiations without using this fact. So this is more uh, for those of you who have seen a bit of category theory. Okay, so with this definition, now let's instantiate it for the um, example that we have up there of infinite streams and um, head and tail. So if I write down um, the instantiation for that functor, What I get is the following. So I have head and tail, and I have some other system and basically what I get is that, um, okay, that's a bad name. So given a coalgebra of that type, if I take um, H, H is unique, means that if I read now the commutativity of this, that the head of H of some element Y equals O of Y, because down here I have the identity in A times H. And then it tells me that the tail of H of Y is H of T of Y. And so basically, it's, it's really telling me that to define this function H, I need to tell, I need to know what head and tail do. And this goes back to the first lecture when we were defining streams um, and seeing that because streams are co-inductive types, you um, basically need to look at what the destructors do to a certain stream. Okay? So for instance, let's look at one example. If I take y to be Let's look at a very simple example to start with. So if I take y to be just one element set y, and O of y is some letter A, and T of y is y, What would be H of Y, you think? Yeah, H of Y would be, if I read out from there, you will see that the first element is A, and then it tells me that the tail is equal to itself because T of Y is Y. 
So, it's te so if I just instantiate those equations, it says that the head of h of y is a, and it says that the tail of h of y is h of y. So that's the, fo that's the stream of all a's. Okay, can everyone see that? So you can do um, variations on this, like adding another element here. Let's call it Z. Um, So um, if you have two elements in Y and you define the output of one to be A and the other one to be B, then you read out the equations again. So you have that the head, the head of H of Y is A, the tail is now the H of Z. And then you look at the same equations for Z and you see that the head of H of Z is B. So the second element is going to be a b, because that's where I go here. And the tail of h of z is the h of y. Okay. So you basically have a two-step loop in your definition. So you get this solution, the stream. A, B, A, B, A, B. Exercise to do now. Oh, yeah, sorry. This one? Yep. It's unique for. There exists a unique H, so for every beta, so the for all is there. And in the algebra case, the for all is there. So for every beta, there exists a unique H such that this diagram commutes. So it's for all. And that's why in these examples, I'm instantiating one particular beta, and then I get a unique solution. And that's why I'm defining a stream. This one? Yeah. So this one is an instantiation of that for the functor a cross x. So that's the functor. And then I'm, this is for all. So this is saying for all OT, there exists a unique thing here. Um, so exercise uh, what why O and T do I need to define the function merge? For each OT, there exists a single H 
there exists an H. So you remember the function merge from last time that takes two streams and produces one stream? How would you um, define the function merge in this way? Sorry? I want merge to be the H. So what would you have to put on the um, left side for that to work? So one thing um, we didn't do, both for the natural numbers and for the streams, was to actually show, I mean, I gave it to you uh, for free. I said that is the final co-algebra. But let's actually show it, just so that you see uh, why this is the final co-algebra. Okay? Because everything I talked here was mostly about um, existence. Uh, but let's show that, indeed, this map would be unique in general. Okay, let's do that and then we can take a five minute break. So let me clear the board. So the statement is um, A omega with head and tail is the uh, final S co-algebra. So if I start with some O and T, what I need to show is that there exists a unique morphism here that makes this diagram commute. So how do we do that? So we're going to define H. So if I give you an element in X, I'm going to say, okay, H, X is a stream at, at position N. Remember that the stream is a function from the natural numbers into A. Does what? Does the output of applying the function T N times to X? So I'm claiming that this H gives you exactly the unique morphism that you need there. Why is that? I mean, if you look at the commutativity in the way we did in the examples, you start with an element here, X. And what this commutativity enforces is, OK, the, the zero element of your stream has to be O of X, because the commutativity tells me that the head of h of x has to be o of x. So that's the condition number one you have. So you know that the head of the stream hx, let's call that h0, has to be o of x. Then hx of 1 has to be what? Is the head of doing one step, right? So I do a tail, so it's the head of the tail. So I do the tail, and I know that the tail has to be, using the commutativity, the same thing as doing a transition for the little x and then applying h again. So what I get here, I get O of t 
of x, sorry, O. Let me write this here. You get O of H of T of X. Yes, sorry. Sorry, thank you. And you get that for zero. And then that is O of T of X. Thank you. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to move here. So we get that h of x of 0 is O of x. We get that h of x of 1 is h of t of x of 0, which is O of t of x. And so on. If you do this for 2 and 3, you will see the pattern that you, what you end up with is O of applying t n times to little x. Okay, so that is the definition I proposed for H. It is the definition we were using here intuitively when you were, we were defining these examples. And so now we need to prove two things. We need to prove that H makes that diagram commute. And then we need to prove um, uniqueness. So the commutativity, how do we prove commutativity? So we have to show that A equals O of X. Well, head of that is H of X zero, which is that by definition. Okay, so that um, is by definition. And then the tail of H of X we need to show is um, H of T of X, that's what we want to show. So what do we know about the tail of H of X? We know that that is H of X N plus one, if I apply this um, to N. And I know that H of T of X of N, according to my definition, is O of T of N of X. Uh, Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. So it's T of N. One second. Before I start messing up the whole thing. So it is O of T of N applied to T of X. Right? And now we have T of N and t, which is just O of t of n plus 1 of x, which is exactly what I wanted. Okay. So that's the commutativity. Now for you.
what we do is say, okay, suppose there exists another function g that makes that diagram commute, so that goes from a omega and it satisfies the same equations, namely that the head of g of x is O of x and that the tail that the tail of h g of x is g of t of x. So suppose we have such g, now we need to show that that g coincides with our h. So how do we do that? We do that by induction on n. So for n equals zero, we know that g associates Ox, because that's by um, the definition of the commutativity, okay? And then uh, you basically just use this equation and induction to recover exactly, exactly that. So this is by induction on n. We show that g of x of n equals h of x of n. And it is, it is a routine calculation, okay? So exercise. So A omega, together with head and tail, is the final co-algebra for this functor. And that is why, when we were looking at all those concrete definitions of streams that were um, set, that we wrote by basically just defining the destructors, the value of the destructors, we got unique solutions. So we never said that in the, in the first lecture. We were just somehow following the intuition um, on how those definitions worked, but there is a reason why they work, and it's because this diagram exists and um, is unique. Okay, so let's take a five minute break, if that's okay. Uh, let's start again. So there was a question during the break um, about uniqueness, which I think I'm gonna. Um, answer for everyone and actually do a little bit uh, of material I was not planning to do. Um, so when I say uniqueness and when I talk about the final co-algebra and the initial algebra, um, I'm always thinking up to isomorphism. So final co-algebras are unique up to isomorphism. Um, so let's, let's prove that. And actually, um, I was not planning in showing you this, but I'm, um, I've just decided I'll show you also the proof of Lambeck's lemma that says that um, an initial algebra, let's call it I, and a final co-algebra, let's call it omega for a moment, has this special property that the transition map is also always an isomorphism, okay? So this is Lambeck's lemma. So in essence, Lambeck's lemma actually tells you that every initial algebra is also a co-algebra because you can turn the error wrong. And every final co-algebra is an F-algebra. So um, I'm going to write this down again um, properly, and I'm going to write the, what uniqueness means, and maybe let's go through the proofs of that um, for a, some categorical intermezzo. So if you have a functor f and the following is true. So if initial algebras
exist, then they are unique up to um, isomorphism. So what does that mean? That means if I have two um, initial F algebras, Fu and Fu prime, then there is a map between U and U prime that is an isomorphism and makes the diagram commute. So it's an F algebra map. Okay? So that diagram commutes. And two, the alpha is um, is an ISO as well, meaning that you have an inverse. You have an inverse from U to F of U. Okay. Let's see the proof of this. So let's see the proof of one. So how are we going to define, so we need to define this map. Let's call it F. We need to define this map, and we need to show that it's an ISO. OK? Who has ideas on how to define F? So I'm assuming both U and U prime are initial algebras. So how can I define F? Exactly. So the, the fact that U is an initial algebra gives me a map F into U prime. And the fact that u prime is an initial algebra gives me a map, let's call it f prime, into u. I also have, so I have, I have a unique, sorry, I have these, these maps, so that's the existence part of initiality. Now to show that these maps are inverse to each other, because that's what we need to show that it's an isomorphism, so we need to show that F composed with F prime is identity, and the other way around. We're going to use the uniqueness part of initiality, because what else we know from the fact that you an initial algebra, well, we know that we know that there is a unique map from U to itself. So what map is that? So the identity is a unique map from unique algebra map from U to itself. But now if we take those two diagrams and we paste them together, 
what do we have? We have fu, fu prime, fu, So I have that F prime composed with F is a map between U and U, but U is an initial algebra. So that must be the identity. Right? And in the same way, we have a similar diagram for U prime. And so you can compose those diagrams the other way around, and you get that F prime composed with F is the identity. And therefore, if you have two initial algebras, they must be isomorphic. OK? So that's the uniqueness um, proof. And that's um, kind of a nice example on how Sometimes reasoning diagrammatically can be um, quite convenient because you sort of, once you draw the diagram, you see that there's only one way to kind of plug them together to obtain what you're looking for. Okay, so now let's try to show, so point two here is Lambeck's lemma. Let's look at the proof of Lambeck's lemma. And by the way, uh, I'm only showing this for algebras because if you want the same result for co-algebras, you just turn all the arrows around and the proof works exactly the same. Okay, so that, I mean, what I wrote there for initial algebras holds for final co-algebras as well. And the, pro the proof is, lit is really the same proof. Okay, so let's do the proof of um, Lambeck's lemma. And let's again draw the diagrams and think whether we can get the result by applying initiality again. So we want to show that Fu, so if U is an initial algebra, What do we want to show? We want to show that the transition map of the initial algebra we would like to show that that is an iso. So what do we need? We need to define some let's call it alpha uh, maybe alpha prime is a bad name, let's call it alpha minus one, from u to f of u. And then we want to show that um, the composition of these maps is, is identity. So we want to define a, a function from u to f of u. So let's think for a second what initiality tells us. If I want to define a function from u to f of u, initiality would allow me to do that if I could have what there? F f u. So if I can, uh, sorry. If I can put here an algebra structure, f, f, u to f, u, then I know that there exists a unique map there that makes this diagram commute. Right? So can we think of a candidate to put there? Sorry. F alpha. 
the types seem to match, so why not? So if we take A to be F alpha, then we know that there exists a map from U to F of U. Okay, that's one candidate. But what do we need now this map to satisfy? We need this map to satisfy that this is the identity in F of U and that this is the identity in U. Right, so that's the last, so the last missing piece is to show that this alpha minus one that we defined in this way actually composes with alpha in a way that you get identities, so that it is an isomorphism. Okay, so let's try to use the same trick as before. So we know, so if we start on the right here, we know that the identity is the only algebra map between U and itself, right? So, is everyone still with me? Or? So how are we gonna show that alpha composed with alpha minus one is the identity. Okay, so I'm gonna flip the diagram around. So what do I know? I know that the identity in U is the only algebra map between F U and itself. This is what I know. So now, how can I recover this map by using this diagram and the diagram for alpha? Ideas? So I have this map, right? This diagram for alpha minus one. I'll take a different color. So I have this I have this definition diagram. This is how I defined alpha minus one. So what can I do here? You want to go to you here? Yes. How? By alpha, okay. Right, but for that, I need that alpha here. So I need that. I mean, I need the whole square. And how do I know that? Indeed. So the only thing I have here is exactly the same thing. Alpha composed with F alpha is alpha composed with F alpha. And now I have two squares that are algebra morphisms. And so the only thing I can have here is the identity on U. Okay? 
and you do the same thing or a similar thing to obtain the other identity. And um, that gives you Lambeck's lemma. And that goes back to a remark I made uh, some time ago that if you take the natural numbers with the um, zero successor maps we looked at before, and if you go back with predecessor, I mean, the reason why these maps are there is because the natural numbers are an initial algebra, and this is a witness of that isomorphism. Dually, for the infinite stream case, when we have head and tail, what would be the canonical inverse? Concatenation, cons. So you take an element and you put it at the head of your stream. And that's a nice one. So those are instances of Lambeck's lemma. Let's look at a few more examples of initial algebras and final co-algebras. Okay, some we have seen yesterday. If I take the functor f, one plus a times x, what is the initial algebra of that functor? It's precisely the finite words over A. And the algebra map is given by um, the empty word injection and the concatenation of A with another word. So we've seen that yesterday. Not yesterday, the day before yesterday. I think I also mentioned this at some point, that that functor has a final co-algebra. And that is given by A infinity, which is the union of all finite words and all infinite words. So this map um, is just defined by doing choice. If it's the empty word, I send it there. Uh, if it's not the empty word, I just split it into the first letter and the rest. And the rest can either be a finite word or an infinite word. Okay. How about this functor here? So the one with just one x is infinite streams, so infinite sequences of a's. If I have two x's, what is the what do you think the final co-algebra could be? Trees. So it's infinite binary trees. So these are infinite binary trees over a, which are functions from. I mean, one way of defining it is as functions from 
um, words over the two element alphabet that tells you whether you're going left, left or right um, to A. So these are infinite Okay. I think I'm going to um, stop here because if I start the next thing I had in mind, um, it will take too long. Um, maybe just one remark about a question I got on, on Monday. Um, if you look at Lambeck's lemma and also at the definition of initiality and finality, uh, you will start recognizing, if you are familiar with it, the more uh, lattice theoretic approach um, to data types. So there is a way of building these initial algebras and these final algebras by basically building the fixed point of this equation that the functor defines. And then initial algebra is a least fixed point and the final whole algebra is a greatest fixed point. And I mentioned this um, on Monday and um, the fact that you have these fixed points comes back in uh, Lambeck's lemma. So Lambeck's lemma basically is telling you that the initial algebra is a fixed point, and the fact that you have um, the initiality bit will give you the least fixed point, and the finality bit will give you the greatest fixed point. Okay, so for those of you who are uh, familiar with sort of lattice theoretic approaches to um, semantics, um, it is still there. It is uh, somehow masquerade in these diagrams and these isomorphisms, but you can go back and forth between the two formulations um, quite easily. Okay, and I'll stop here. <laughs>